a bad example is just as valuable as a good example. In fact, it's possible for a person to be a good, bad example. I first learned this lesson years ago when I visited my dad's workplace. He's since retired, but he worked as an investment advisor and took me on a tour of his building there. And we came to a large corner office at one point, and it had huge windows on two sides and just really nice hardwood furniture and the leather and all that sort of thing, marble on some of those things and the fixtures and just the best of everything. And so I said to my dad, wow, this guy must be really good. And he told me, no, Scott, he's terrible. If he says a stock is going up, it goes down the next day. If he says a stock is going to go down, well, it goes up like it never has before. And so I said, well, dad, if he's that bad, why does he have such a nice office? I mean, why don't you just fire him? And my dad said, fire him? No way, he's one of our best employees. Now, I was confused at that point, and I said, Dad, I thought you said this guy was always wrong. And my dad said, he is, but Scott, in this business, someone who is always wrong is just as valuable as someone who's always right. Whatever he does or says, we just do the opposite. If he says buy, we sell. If he says sell, we buy. And so this company has made a lot of money by never following his advice. And so I say a bad example is just as valuable as a good example. And the Bible is full of good examples. People like Paul and Noah and Moses and Ruth and Esther and Mary. But the Bible is also full of good, bad examples. People like Cain and Jezebel and Judas, Herod and Pontius Pilate. And of course, that list is also very long. And we would be wise to learn the lessons from each. From the good examples, we can learn what to do, what kind of life to live, what kind of faith to have. And from the bad examples, we can learn what not to do, mistakes not to make, sins not to share. And that brings us to 1 Corinthians 10. Good examples of bad examples. Twice in this chapter, we will see the word example. And it's there, for example, in verse 6. It says, now these things became our examples. And verse 11, if you hop down there, it says, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, which also means just basically warning or correction. And so these examples here in 1 Corinthians that we will see tonight are not good examples, but they are just as valuable. In fact, we can learn a lot from good, bad examples. And before we dive into the chapter, we need to know at least a little Greek. Now, I know one thing about Greek. There's the Greek salad down at the cafe that Rudy makes, and that's really good. But this is a Greek word that you need to know. It's the word translated type or example. It's the underlying word there in Greek, tupos. And it's the word that we get the English word type or typology. And unless we understand this concept right here, much of the Bible especially the Old Testament, will remain a mystery to us. And I like to put it this way. For every New Testament principle, there is an Old Testament picture. The Old Testament, you could say, is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so the Old Testament is full of these examples and types, as they are called, tupos, patterns and pictures and symbols. And they are physical things or people, or events with a much deeper significance than we might see just right on the surface, as it is explained in the New Testament. And sometimes people see uh, all kinds of symbolism here and there, but I like to stick to that which the New Testament says, this is what the Old Testament was painting that picture. We can be very confident of those things, not reading too much into the picture. But as we've seen here in 1 Corinthians, we've seen a church that is pretty messed up. A lot of immaturity, a lot of immorality, a lot of idolatry. We saw food fights and all the rest. And they obviously needed in their lives some good examples to follow. And certainly Paul was one, but they also apparently needed some good bad examples, some things to avoid. And again, sometimes we can learn as much or more from a bad example than we can from a good one by just simply doing the opposite. And so who could be a better bad example for these Corinthians? 
than the Old Testament Israelites. See, in many ways, the Israelites were the best of the worst. They made every possible major mistake that you could make, and sometimes many times over. And so the Corinthians apparently needed some bad examples in their life. And sometimes we need some bad examples in our life. And so as 1 Corinthians 10 unfolds here, we're going to see Paul pointing back to some good, bad examples from the Old Testament. So let's look at it here in verse 1, chapter 10. It says this, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, pausing right there, this chapter is looking back on the events of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and some of the recent Wednesday night teachings covered that very section of Scripture. So this may sound familiar to some of you, but new to others. And so I'll do just a quick review here, which is that the Exodus from Egypt was a real historical event, but it's also a spiritual picture painted for us. God put these eternal examples into his word so that we would be able to see them, learn from them. And so it's very important for us to see here that the exodus from Egypt, from slavery there, it's a picture of the process of salvation. In the Bible, Egypt is a type, a tupos, an example a symbol of sin, a bondage of slavery and misery. And don't misunderstand, it's not talking about somebody with an Egyptian background today being somehow worse than somebody else. That's not the point. The point is in the Bible, that was a place in which God's people really suffered. There was oppression under Pharaoh, and he being a type, an example, a symbol of Satan, a cruel master who kept them in bondage. And how did their salvation physically come about? Well, you may know that story that the Passover, the perfect Passover lamb there was slain, and the blood shed and put over the door of the Israelites' house. And in that process, the angel of death would pass over, and hence the name Passover. And in that process, of course, Pharaoh and all of the Egyptians, their firstborn died, and they said, hey, get these guys out of here. We want them out of the land of Egypt. And so they went out into freedom from slavery. And so the New Testament helps us to connect the dots here and helps us to see that the Passover was really a God-given picture of Jesus, the Lamb of God who shed his blood for us so that we might go from the slavery of sin into freedom of faith. And so the Israelites here, they were out of Egypt. They were headed for that place, the promised land. And so that point of freedom, that day in which the Passover occurred, it was followed by a process, a process of change and growth and maturity. And there were lots of tests and trials and difficulties along the way. But they had the promises of God. They had the protection of God. And they were uh, under new management, if you want to think it that way. And so verse 1, if you'll look at it there in 1 Corinthians 10, if you have a pen, circle the word cloud, and next to it write, Holy Spirit. See, that cloud that was there, a visible manifestation of God, it says that they had the pillar of cloud by day, the uh, pillar of fire by night, shelter from the sun, but also direction during the night. And you see Exodus 13 verses 21 through 22, discussing that very directly. And so this was a protection here, even from Pharaoh's army, as they could not see through the cloud. And you also see in verse 1 another word that's very important. Symbolically, you're going to see, circle the word C, S-E-A, and next to it write baptism. The crossing of the Red Sea, of course, it was a historical event and has significance there, but it was also a picture being painted in God's word of water baptism, as it explains there. And note, it's not the point of salvation, not at all. No, the Passover was that picture, and that had already occurred. But salvation having come, well, there was still this act of obedience, this time where they came and went through the water. And there, that baptism, an act and response of faith, to the work of God in their life. And so there is a baptism coming up this month, and I would encourage you to obey the command of God in this area. It's about leaving your old life behind, and a symbol of that, the death, burial, and resurrection of the believer. And you see the Egyptians at that point dying there in the Red Sea, and just a reminder that that water baptism can become a very practical, meaningful thing, that that can be a point where there are certain sins that get left behind 
even there on that day. And so the important thing to remember is that there were other enemies ahead in their life. Even after they went through the Red Sea, it wasn't the end of the difficulties or challenges in their life. Certainly there was uh, some difficulty ahead in the wilderness and even in the promised land there continued to be enemies that they would have to drive out. But God got the Israelites out of Egypt at a point. Just right there in a day, God got the Israelites out of Egypt. But now God had to get Egypt out of the Israelites. And in the same way, God can get us out of sin in a day, but sometimes it takes a lot longer than that to get sin out of us. It's a lifetime process for him. But we see how God took care of their needs in the desert there in verse 3. This is what it says, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, anytime there are repeated words in Scripture, we would be wise to pay special attention to them because as a parent, when I repeat myself, it's because I don't believe that my kids will get it right the first time and sometimes I think it needs to be repeated if it's important. And so three times in two verses here, it says the same word, spiritual. It says spiritual food, spiritual drink, spiritual rock. Why that repetition? Well, Paul is really wanting to drive home a point, which is that it was a supernatural supply, that the wilderness did not naturally have what they needed, the food and the water to sustain life. And so God gave them supernaturally manna. And manna was just bread from heaven. And don't miss this, we're talking tonight about examples, about tupos, about typology some, and that manna was actually pointing to a man. The manna was a symbol of a man. What man? Jesus. And don't take my word for it, take God's word for it. You see, Jesus saying in John 6, I am the manna that came from heaven. I am the bread of life. I am the nourishment you need. That's what he was saying. The natural world really has nothing for you. It's just a big wilderness, but only I can supernaturally satisfy the deep needs of your life. And so he's talking there about that spiritual drink, also in verse 4. And it says, water came from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, don't get, again, the the misconception that somehow Jesus was the original rolling stone, you know, and he was there rolling along behind them in the wilderness or something like that, following them around in the little legs underneath the rock like it is in the cartoons. It's not saying that he was literally a rock. It's a picture, again, a symbol that it's talking about, saying that that provision that was there in the wilderness was a picture of Jesus and what he would do for us in our lives spiritually. The water miraculously came out from that rock, whenever the Israelites, Israelites needed it. Whenever they were dried up, whenever they were about to die of thirst, well, along would come this supernatural water from the rock. And so they would get to that point where they say, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, Moses. And there at God's command, Moses struck the rock. Exodus 17, if you jot that down. Exodus 17, the first seven verses talk about the story and it says the water came out of the rock and met their need. And then later, God told Moses as the people were needing water, he, he said, Moses, just talk to the rock. You don't need to strike the rock, just talk to the rock, Exodus 20. And Moses was mad, see, and he went out and he struck that rock again. He was tired of the people's thirst and tired of the people's complaints, and he started whacking the rock, and water still came out. This is real important to see, that just because man messed up, God still gave grace. But God told him, hey, Mo, I need to see you in my office. See, God has a really nice office too, I'm sure. But Moses, he goes in there and, and basically says, hey, Moses, you've usually been a very good example. But this time, you were a good, bad example. You messed up my picture. You kind of made things hazy there as I'm trying to explain something, that the rock is a representation of Christ. And see, the misre misrepresentation of the message that Moses did there is that we need to continue to strike and strike and strike that rock. No, in fact, Christ only had to be struck once at the cross as he took on the sins of the world. But after that, to have him meet that deep thirst need that you have in your life, well, what is it? It's just simply to talk to the rock and the living water 
would flow out. And so Moses messed up that message, but you still get it here tonight. And so now we see the meat of tonight's message, I believe, which is these first four verses here in 1 Corinthians 10. Another repeated word. It's the word all. You'll see it if you read those first verses there. Five times it says all, 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 all. But then in verse 5 you see a new word, and that word is most. Most. Look at it with me in verse 5. It says, but with most of them, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, stopping there, again, when it comes to good, bad examples, the Israelites were among the best of the worst. And what it's saying here with that word all, it says all of them had amazing advantages in life. God had done some supernatural stuff. Sometimes people think, man, if I saw a major miracle like the parting of the Red Sea, then I would believe, then I would follow God. But you see in their life, they had all these amazing advantages, and yet most ended in terrible tragedy. See, God's word is giving us a warning here, an admonition, a correction, saying, here are some good, bad examples that you can learn from so you don't make the same mistake they did. See, that verse 5, I think it's interesting. It says most. In other words, the majority, not well pleased. That was God's reaction, not well pleased. Notice that it doesn't say eternally lost. It doesn't say that. It just says God was not pleased with the outcome of their life. Again, they had been set free from Egypt, but there they were scattered in the wilderness. A whole generation that died in the desert never made it to the promised land. And often people have made this mistake and thought and taught that Canaan, the promised land, was a symbol in the scripture of heaven. And so you see hymns written that say, to Canaan's land, I'm on my way, where the soul never dies. You know, a place that would happen after you die, the eternal spot, but that's really not the picture being painted. Those are good tunes maybe, but bad theology. See, because Canaan is not a picture of heaven. The promised land is a picture of the promised life that we could have here before heaven. A life of faith and trust, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, a life that is led by the Spirit, full of the Spirit, and overflowing with the living water of God. And we'll talk more about that topic even as we hit 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, which are specifically about that. But Canaan, just know this now is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the spirit-filled life, the spirit-led life, and there were still plenty of enemies and battles and all ups and downs in Canaan, even after the Israelites made it there. But that second generation that found that, it was a life of victory, not a life of defeat in the desert. And so with that understanding, what we see from the good, bad examples of the Israelites, most of whom never made it to Canaan. Here it is, very important for you to get this as the major jumping point for the rest of the chapter. Most Christians never actually live the life that God has available for them. It's true that certainly unbelievers are not living the life that God has for them, but sadly many Christians, maybe even a majority sometimes, never actually lived the life that God has available for them. Many who trust the Lord to get them out of Egypt, so to speak, never really allow him to take them on into Canaan. Many have enough faith in Christ to save them, but never really walk forward in faith, in freedom, in fullness, in fruitfulness. And that means that it's possible in our lives to have a saved soul and a lost life. A lost life where the opportunities that were here for us, we really did not take full advantage of them. And so what happened to the Israelites there physically can certainly happen to us spiritually along the way. We can wander in that wilderness of wickedness. We can kind of get all dried out in the desert of doubt, you know, and start feeling these things and that thing and running our life by our feelings instead of by faith. And you see that the world that we live in is so much like the wilderness that they walk through, isn't it? Hostile, dry, hard, discouraging, a lot of things that can bite you out there and that kind of thing. And so the Israelites as God's people always have had to, had to walk by faith and not by sight. And sight, this is what it told them, just like it tells us, hey, go back to Egypt, man. <laughs> this wilderness is not worth it. I can tell you that much. God is not with you. That is what sight would have said. All I see is sand, you know, out here. This is about what it's about. 
And faith had said, you know what? God has given you this promised land and you need to go forward in faith into it. There is going to be some obstacle along the way, absolutely. And so sight, again, was constantly telling them, it's better back in Egypt. You know, why did you ever leave that place? It was so wonderful. Faith was saying, you know, God has called you forward into Canaan. And so that trip for them should have taken about a month, at the most. I mean, even less than that, really. But it took 40 years. And again, most of them didn't make it. Think about that. Most didn't make it. Now, some of you are saying, thanks a lot for the encouragement tonight, Pastor Scott. Most didn't make it. I guess most of us won't ever make it. No, 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 no. That's not the message at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The exact opposite is being told here because what it's saying is, all of us can make it into that promised life if we will heed and follow these good, bad examples and not follow them by looking at them and saying, I'm not going that way. I know one thing I won't do. It's what they did. And so as we keep reading, we'll see the whole point of this passage is that encouragement that these spiritual potholes that they fell into, they're avoidable if we know where they are, if we know what they're about. We don't have to die in the desert. We don't have to wander in the wilderness indefinitely. We don't have to have a saved soul and a lost life. No, we can learn these hard lessons, and they are hard lessons, but we can learn them the easy way. I love learning things the easy way. How do you learn the easy way? You watch someone else do it wrong, and you go, well, I'm not going to do it that way. And so God gave us plenty in the scriptures of good, bad examples. So we can say, I'm going in a different direction. And let's do that tonight. You'll see in verse 6, it says, Now these things became our examples to the intent. This is God's purpose in it, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, in verses 6 through 10, what we're going to see, just to give you a little preview, we're going to see five good, bad examples. Okay, five good, bad examples. If you're taking notes in your, on your page or in your mind. And if we just allow God to warn us away from these five things, it's going to be amazing how we might find for the first time that we're beginning to have promised land lives. You know, the kind of abundant life that God really promised to us. Not ones absent of difficulties. I'm not talking about that. But we can look closely at these good, bad examples and do the exact opposite. We say, okay, I know where I don't want to go. This is what he talks about first, verse 6. A good, bad example will have wicked wants. If you want to look at a good, bad example, look at somebody who has wicked wants. It talks there about lusting. Now, we typically think of this word in a sexual sense, almost exclusively, right? I mean, people say, oh, lust. Uh, I guess he's talking about that. Well, not necessarily. See, it's possible to lust after power. Think about that. Or possessions or popularity or even pot roast, as we're going to see here. Pot roast, you may say, wow, m m well, my mother-in-law is quite a great cook, but I don't know that I would say I've lusted after the pot roast there. But let me refer you back to the original story in the Old Testament. Again, we always point back to those pictures, and it helps us understand. If you jot this down in your margin, you'll see Numbers 11, verse 4. It tells you exactly what they were lusting after. Numbers 11, verse 4, I'll read it to you. It says, now the mixed multitude who were among them, those who had come out of Egypt, that's what it's talking about. It says they yielded to intense craving. They gave in to their lust. If you have a King James uh, translation, I like the way it says it. It says they fell a lusting. That sounds kind of like something a, a pirate would say. You know, Arr, we fell a lusting, you know. But that's what it says. So the children of Israel wept again and said, oh, who's going to give us meat to eat? Pot roast. It says, we remember the fish we ate freely, that free fish, man, in Egypt. That stuff was awesome. It says, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our whole being is all dried up, and there's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now, again, what are they saying here? What's going on? They're saying, no more manna cotti. No more manna banana bread. I'm tired of this stuff. God's giving these things, but I've had it with what God is providing. And this is so funny to me. They're lusting for fish and cucumbers. Now, that cucumbers, you know, whenever I, I like salad, but I, I always give my wife the little cucumber slices. I just don't like that. Leeks, whatever those are, no way. Think about lusting for leeks. Yeah, that's what I can't. Whoo, I miss those Egyptian onions, man, and the garlic. So what does this tell us? It tells us you can get in a state where you're lusting over after some pretty crazy things, things that in many ways don't even exist. 
And so a lesson from their good, bad example is this. Watch after your wants. Look after what your heart desires. Be very careful about rose-colored glasses that look back to Egypt and say, man, what a great thing Egypt was. You know, that's the old life again. Looking back, oh, man, it was so wonderful. If it's so wonderful, why did you cry out to Christ for a new life? See, we have so often in sin a selective memory. You know, we remember the good and forget the bad kind of thing, even good that didn't really happen. Oh, man, the parties we used to have as heathens. Nobody remembers the hangovers we used to have as heathens. And people will look on and so often they'll fall a lust in. Again, looking at those things and, man, look how great my godless co-workers are doing. They're, you know, getting promoted as they're lying and cheating and stealing and all the rest of this stuff maybe. Maybe I should go back to the old life and the old ways. And you see Psalm 106, verse 15. This is a great one to know, even if you don't know exactly where it is. Psalm 106, 15. It says a commentary on this. God granted them their desire, but he sent leanness into their soul. Ever had that happen where you got what you wanted and you found out it wasn't what you wanted? And you found out, you know, there's different ways to be miserable in life. One is to get everything you ever wanted. And so they got what they wanted physically, but they dried up spiritually. And so we need to watch our wants. That's the first pothole to avoid here. And then verse 7, it says, Don't become idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now this is good, bad example number two, which is wicked worship. We already saw the first one there. Wicked wants, but now wicked worship. And remember, Corinth was a pagan place, right? It, it was surrounded by and infected with wicked worship. Great danger there in life of having that spirituality that still does not have true godliness. Because, you know, you listen to people and just about everyone's spiritual in some sense. And that's getting to be very popular in our society, to be spiritual. Well, I'm really not into Jesus, but I'm just kind of into the spiritual things. And so Paul points them back to some good, bad examples in the Israelites. Verse 7, again, it says, they ate and they drank and they rose up to play. Now, some of you are thinking, isn't that nice? They had a church picnic and then a sports day. They rose up to play. This is great, you know, play a little volleyball or whatever. No. Play is a euphemism in the Bible, the way it's said there in the Hebrew. It is a euphemism for drunken revelry, a total orgy that was going on out there. And the original story, again, is found in Exodus 32. And I'll just summarize it for us here tonight. This was, again, God's people who had come out of Israel. They should have known so much better than this. But their worship of God, well, it didn't end it just got warped. It just became wicked. It was distorted. They stayed spiritual, but they also got carnal, off base. And so Moses had gone up to get the Ten Commandments. You may know the story. And they were saying, hey, we're tired of waiting on God's word. You know, it's, I don't even know if it's worth waiting for. We want a God we can see. We want a God that we can experience. We want a God that we can make in our own image. You know, one that we can kind of direct and do things the way we want to do it. And so they wanted a spirituality that allowed for carnality. You know, just a, hey, spiritual, but very sensual. And so you see Aaron, you know, Moses' brother, and he has the golden calf there, and he says to him, this is your God. This is the guy who brought you out of Egypt. And he tells him, we're going to have a feast to the Lord. You know, so he's mixing all of these things, mixed message where it's like golden calf, God Almighty. Okay, well, let's see if we can somehow merge the two. And so it was spiritual sounding, but it was warped. At the heart of it, it was ungodly. And this, if you respect the classics, one of the great classic excuses here of all time is when Moses comes back and Aaron tells him, you know what, Mo? I don't know what happened, man. We just kind of were here at the campfire and we dropped a few things gold in and woo, out came the calf. And so we thought, Let's worship it, you know, let's get naked and dance around it. I don't know how it happened. You know, parents, if you ever, you know, go on a trip and the kids and they say that, you'll know it's, it's just not true. And so we see here Aaron, the brother of Moses, again, should have been a good example, right? But he was a good, bad example. And so I saw it just in the news the other day. Maybe you saw it. An Emmy Award winner. You know, somebody with certainly some form of talent that's being recognized by our society. But this is what she did. She ridiculed Jesus. And she ridiculed those who thank God 
in their acceptance speeches. Now, I won't even say her name, but here's the thing. She said, Jesus had absolutely nothing to do with this and then kissed the statue and said, this statue is now my God. Now, that's a good, bad example, my friends. But here's the thing. Not all worship, not all wicked worship is that blatant. Sometimes we go, oh, ooh. but you know what? We can see that we need to watch how we worship and what we worship. Because really, again, it's not about singing songs. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that worship answers this question. What has my heart? What has my heart? And you know what? It's very easy for my heart to get drawn away after other things. And if anything less than God is taking his place and has more of my devotion and passion and more of my interest than God, then it's become an idol, even if it seems really spiritual. And so you see in verse 8, it says, Do not, or let us not, let us not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 died. They fell. And so this is number three here. A good, bad example has wicked works. At the end of the day, wicked works. Now, I like to say it this way. Sins of a feather flock together. What does that mean? Well, you'll rarely see one sin by itself. You know, they tend to congregate. And so you see idolatry and immorality kind of hand in hand here. And the original story that this is referring back to, again, Numbers 25. And again, we just looked at some of these things on a Wednesday night. So I'll summarize it for you here tonight. You may, remain, may remember Balaam and Balak. And the king of Moab there hired Balaam, this guy, a prophet for prophet, a spiritual man. But he was a guy who was there hired to curse Israel, okay? And so it's kind of a funny story if you think about it. He tried to curse and out came a blessing. So it's kind of like those Jackie Chan movies or whatever where his mouth is doing this and he's, if you read his lips, you're going, that's a cursing, but his voice is saying a blessing. I don't get it. Well, what he said to the king of Moab there after the fact is he said, listen, I failed, but I'll tell you what, you can succeed in getting them to sin, and here's how. I can't curse them, but you can corrupt them. If you corrupt them, sin carries its own judgment, and you know what? They will be cursed with the curse of sin. If you can't get them to, uh, you know, God to curse them directly, all you got to do is corrupt them. And so God's righteous judgment would then be upon them. And so you see him giving the king this tip. And the king passes it on. And the women of Moab there, they kind of come up to the Israelite guys and say, hi, boys, let's show you how we worship. You know, and, and so all of the Israelite boys are saying, mom, I think I'm going to change my religion, you know. <laughs> and so a plague broke out there. And thousands died, it said. And so you see in that even forgiven sin can have incredible consequences in a person's life because sin carries its own curse. And even if Jesus has forgiven me for something or will forgive me or something, it doesn't mean that it's not going to cause great harm and great difficulty in my life and the lives of others around me. And so he's saying, hey, avoid that. There's a good, bad example of somebody who thought they were heading for pleasure and the reality is they were heading straight into pain. And so verse 4 or I'm sorry, verse 9, it says, let us not tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Now again, he's just cataloging a bunch of Old Testament pictures and going through them, flipping through them real quick, but we're going to talk a little bit about them. It's number four here, a good, bad example has wicked ways. And again, you think about it, it's kind of an interesting phrase, let us not tempt Christ. And you go, well, what does that mean? Well, the word tempt there in that language, it could be translated to test or to prove. And so as you see it in this context, this is what it's saying. And we see it in, especially in light of the example that is given there. That it's trying to force God to prove his faithfulness by doing things my way instead of his way. Hey, God, your word says this. I'm forcing you to do it by claiming it. I want it this way. And so the original story, again, it was Numbers 21. And what they were saying is, hey, why'd you bring us out here to die? Why aren't you doing things our way? You're doing things your way, God, and we don't like it. And it says right there that they tempted God in that, that they were testing him. And you may remember just another place where that same phrase is used, where it says that Satan tried to tempt Christ there in the gospel accounts. And he said, throw yourself down, Jesus, from the temple, and God will catch you because after all, doesn't it say in Psalm 91 that his angels will lift you up and you won't get hurt? 
So what is he doing? He's misusing scripture and he's tempting God because Jesus re referred that very thing. He said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to try to force God to prove his faithfulness by putting myself in harm's way intentionally and say, well, I'll do it my way, God, but you've got to do what I want you to do. And putting yourself in the driver's seat instead of God. That's what he's talking about there. And so a good example will do things God's way, even if it doesn't always make sense. But a good bad example to avoid is somebody who says, well, I'll wrap it in spiritual speech, but I still want things done my way. That's tempting Christ. Let's not do that. Now, verse 10, it says not complaining. This is where it gets a little more personal in some ways, nor complaining. As some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer there. Now, this is the fifth and final one that we're looking at here in this section as we look at good, bad examples. A good, bad example will have wicked words. Now, anytime you have a mouth problem, you really have a heart problem because Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's kind of like when the plumbing gets backed up, you know, and something comes out of the uh, device there, and you say to yourself, oh, well, there's a problem deeper down. Yes, there is. That's what he's saying. When things come out of the mouth, it's really revealing our hidden heart. And so he says, you know what, complaining, this is the problem. It's a heart of unbelief. It's a heart that's denying the goodness of God and the mercy that God has displayed. And, and these guys were pros at griping, that's for sure. If you want a good, bad example of gripers, you know, if you don't have enough maybe in your own life and you say, I need to find someone who can really complain, well, go look at the Israelites. Boy, these guys could complain. And they complained about water and lack thereof and food and lack thereof and leadership and lack thereof and the giants in the land and why they didn't want to go into it and all the rest of this. And if you jot down Numbers 14.2, this is what it says. I'll read it with you. It says, All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we died in Egypt or in this desert. You know, we'd be better off dead. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land? only to let us fall by the sword. You know, first they don't want to die, then they do want to die. And then it says, our wives, our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better? They always had this little chorus to their song. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? You know, the leeks, the onions, remember those things? And they said to each other, man, we should choose a leader who will take us back to Egypt. You know, in life you can always find people who will lead you backwards. That's pretty easy to do. You know, to, hey, backsliding, you'll find no lack of leadership there. But God had promised them a pleasant place if they would go forward in faith to Canaan. And they didn't go in. They died in the desert. Remember, most of them did not go. They wandered in the wilderness. And God had given them a place to go by faith, but it would have had to be by, been by faith, not by sight. And the giants were big, that's for sure. And the cost was high and the risks were great, but the greatest risk was to go back to Egypt. They didn't realize that. And so... They're saying, hey, let's go back to the life we had before. It was better. But in the process of thinking that way, they got bitter. As they thought about how much better the old life was, they got bitter about the new life that God was trying to give them. And the complaining, again, in our life, it may not keep us out of heaven, okay? Fortunately, by the time we get to heaven, nobody will be complaining. But some people will complain their way all the way there. But it'll sure keep you out of Canaan. It'll sure keep you out of the promised life. And it'll keep others out of that promised life as well. And so you see verse 11, it says, these things happened to them. They were good, bad examples, weren't they? It came as examples to us and they were written for our admonition, for our warning to tell us, hey, don't do things this way. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Man, if you've been watching the news, don't you kind of believe the end of the ages have come? Father of all bombs, all kind of stuff going on. Maybe you don't look at the news, but go home and look at it. Then, you, nah, don't, just read the word. Okay, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I love this little phrase here. It's said so many different ways in the Bible. Maybe you know uh, Proverbs 16, 18. It says pride comes before a fall, you know, and so it's the same thing there. But what it's saying is that God recorded these good, bad examples for our benefit, for our blessing. You know, we'd be really wise to look at them. It wasn't so, it wasn't so that we could look at them and say, what a bunch of boneheads. <laughs> Boy, those Israelites, man, I'm sure I'm glad we're not like they are. No, in fact, it's so we wouldn't be like they are. And so we would realize when we are like they are, 
man, we're not heading toward the life that God wants us to live. And so he says in verse 12, take heed lest you fall. And it's when we're most sure of ourselves, when we're most confident in ourselves, that we are most likely to wipe out. Now, some of you remember uh, a few weeks back, I, I brought in the skateboard, you know, and I had it here. And I've fallen a few times. I haven't fallen since then. Now, I'm not going to take, you know, pride in that. I'm just letting you know that I haven't fallen since I came in that day, but I also haven't ridden it much. But, the, but here's the thing. One of the worst falls I ever took in my life was just somewhat recently, just a few years ago. It was very, very painful. And I can tell you this. I was showing off. That's it. There were just, there's a little group of people there, and I was going to show them I still had it. Now, I never had it, and I most certainly... <laughs> Do not still have it, but I was pretending like I did. And one thing I found out is that I do not bounce like I used to, okay? <laughs> when you're young, you bounce, right? When you're older, you thud. <laughs> Boom. And I, literally, I, after I fell, I, my wife knows I, I couldn't feel my legs for a few seconds. I mean, it was like pretty sobering, pretty scary. And I said, oh, you know, maybe skateboarding's for other people and that sort of thing. But it says in here, you know, God is able to keep us from falling. How? Well, by giving us the words of warning that he gave us tonight and by giving us even something better than that, which is the spirit of God in our hearts to make obedience possible. See, we can have the best example in the world, but if we don't have the energy, if we don't have the ability, if we don't have the power to do it, well, then you just look on and say, well, that's a good example, but my life's a bad example. But God gives us something so much better than that. And so we'll spend the remaining time here in just two verses, and that's verse 13 and 14. And this, this is a huge section of Scripture. This is a massive understanding for us. And this is right here how we can avoid becoming just another bad example. I mean, I've said that they're valuable, but I don't know about you. I don't want to be one. I mean, I don't want to have it on my tombstone. He was a great bad example. Man, don't do what he did. No, I, I, I would love to have my life a good example. And so you see in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God's faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation will also make the way of escape that you would be able to bear it. Now, I want to pick apart this passage here with three quick points. The first one, if you're taking notes, jotting some things down, it's to realize that temptations are common to man. Now, it's talking about mankind there. It's, you know, if you're a lady here tonight, guess what? They're coming to woman too. But, but here's the thing. It's so freeing in our life when we realize that temptation is common. See, that we're not alone in our struggles with sin. I don't know if you've maybe come to Christ recently or even a while back, and somehow you get, even if people tell you different, you get this idea that, well, you know, that's all part of the past, you know, and I'm not going to struggle with sin. And this, you come into your first real temptation and you say, man, this is the first time this has ever happened to a Christian. Nobody around here seems to be dealing with this kind of stuff. I'm sure all of this is just for me. And so I got to hide my struggles, man. I got to keep my secrets. I got to make sure that I pretend to be super Christian and everyone thinks that I am. But see, that's not true at all. It's common to all. That's what it's saying here. Everybody, the people sitting next to you are struggling with some of the same things you are. The person standing up here struggles with the same things you do. And so that's what he's saying here. We all face variations of the exact same stuff. It's kind of like this. My son, he loves to play basketball, but he also loves to play video games. And what does he play? basketball and video games, sports simulations. That's what he likes to do. Now, there's thousands of plays on those things. I won't even do them anymore because when I was a kid, you had like one control and it was kind of like a little blip and it'd go up and down. But now it's like you got to press all these different things and be simultaneously doing things. But the thing is, he's figured out a few plays that work really well. Oh, you know, there's a whole manual, big thick thing of all the things you could do, but he's figured out a few plays in the game that works well and he just runs them all the time. And he'll win the game. And in the same way, the devil has three main plays. It's not that there aren't other things in the playbook, but I'm telling you, these work so well, he really doesn't have to get that creative. And so I think it's real important for us to learn to recognize them. That's why the Bible unmasks them. And you see it in 1 John 2.16. If you write that down, 1 John 2.16, this is what it says. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those three plays right there, those have lost many battles for people and won many wars. 
for Satan. You see, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Genesis 3, 6, the first temptation. He, he, that's where he got it started on. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's the lust of the flesh, mm, that forbidden fruit, I'm sure, is a lot better than all the rest. And then you see that it was pleasant to the eyes. Man, that's the prettiest fruit I've ever seen. Everything else is ugly compared to that, that God said don't do that. And a tree desirable to make one wise, you'll be like God. That's the pride of life. And so she took it and she ate it. Now here's the thing. Jesus had those same three categories come against him in the gospel accounts. If you look at it later, you'll see that. But here's what's great. He didn't use some supernatural thing to kind of put down the temptation. What did he say? It's written, it's written, it's written. He just kept saying that. It's written. So you know what? The same tool he used is the same tool we have. He gave it to us. And it's something that in the Spirit of God, the Word of God, just has an ability to disarm the enemy. The fact that others have overcome these common temptations is proof that you and I can too in the same way. Now you see especially that is true when we realize that the second thing here, temptations are not only common to man, but they're controlled by God. I think this really helps me personally as I think it through. It's that You'll see people commonly paraphrase this portion of Scripture. I believe this is what they're paraphrasing when they say, oh, God won't give you more than you can handle. I think it says that somewhere in the Bible. Where the closest match I've ever found to that is here in this very verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where it says, God will not allow temptation beyond what you're able. He's faithful to help you to stand up under those things. So every temptation is first passed through the Father filter. If you think about it that way, it's like a, a parent saying, yeah, this is a test Scott can pass. Maybe he couldn't have passed it two weeks ago, but I think he could do it now. I know he could do it now with my help. And see, here's the thing. That's the whole point. God gives us tests to pass, not to fail. I mean, he's not looking for us to fail. And so he's faithful, and God knows that we can handle certain things with him. And without him, he knows we'll fail. But with him, he'll say, this one, you can do. I don't know if I'm able, God. Well, he knows he is. He knows he's faithful. He knows he can have us be successful in that temptation and pass the test when it's with him. And that helps me because I, I many times used to say, ah, this is too much. No, it isn't. This can be overcome with God's help. And then you see number three, temptations can be overcome. That's what it's saying at the end of this. Now, again, it's not a sin to be tempted. I think many Christians are under condemnation because they're tempted. May I remind you that our Lord was tempted in every way as we are. So it's not a sin to be tempted. The sin is to give in. It's kind of like this. A boy was at a candy aisle there, and he was having an obvious internal struggle, you know, and kind of sweating, looking around nervously and all that sort of thing. Stood there for a long time right in front of the candy. And finally, the manager noticing him came over and said, Son, are you trying to steal some candy? And the kid said, No, sir, I'm trying not to. See, and that's just it. There's that struggle, right? See, and when we sin, we can have that excuse, I couldn't help myself. I couldn't help myself. Exactly, that's true. You can't help yourself, but God can help you in that moment by providing and bringing to light the way of escape. See, that's the very word that it used there, an escape route, the way of escape. Look at it in verse 13. It says, God is faithful to provide a way of escape. And the way of escape, again, it is the word of God applied by the spirit of God right there in our lives at that moment. Every temptation comes with an exit ramp. I've thought about that. The road to ruin comes with an exit ramp. And we need to learn to take it. This is the thing that's so important for us to realize. God will make it, but we have to choose to take it. When it comes to the exit ramp, God will make it. It'll be there. But he's not going to force you onto it. He's going to say, there it is. Here it is. Coming up in one mile, exit ramp, now's the time. And so some practical points just as we close it out on resisting temptation in your life. I just want to share some things that we see from Scripture and certainly have been helpful to me as, again, I struggle with the same exact things that are common to all. And so this is the first one, just some, some words to think about fences. fences. The thing is, if you dance around the edge of sin, sooner or later you'll fall in. It's just that simple. That's why we put fences around pools, right? To keep kids out. And so sooner or later, if you don't have fences in your life, you're going to find yourself falling into sin and saying, I don't know how this happened. But here's what happens. We need to put intentional barriers. During the time when there's not that tension of the temptation, you put the barrier up then. 
Make it difficult. You know, think about it this way. If eating Oreos were a sin, fortunately it's not. I guess it could be, but it's not. But let's say it was. The time to say no to the temptation of the Oreo, the double stuff, is at the store, not at the cupboard. See, here's the thing. Once I brought that bag home, I'm going to eat it. And I'm going to eat it all at once to get it out of the house so the temptation will be gone. You know what I'm saying? Get it over, ask for forgiveness, and move on, you know? But it's almost inevitable once it's there in the cupboard. And it's so much easier to say no at the store. It may be hard, but you go around that aisle and it, the temptation just isn't as strong. And so if you struggle with a certain sin, fence it in. Just say, there isn't going to be an easy way for me with this. So that I'll have plenty of time to, to find the exit ramp. Because if I have to make a quick decision, I'm going to go for the sin. And so learn to look for the flagmen and the barricades that say, hey, bridge out ahead. Take the exit ramp early. It's always easier to take it early than later. Then the second one is fellowship. And this is just the truth that we are stronger together than we are apart. You know, the, the chances right now that I'm going to get deep in some sin while I'm standing here in front of you folks, well, it's kind of a little bit unlikely, you know. And so you think about those things, fellowship with Christians. But here's the thing. We can't always be there with each other. We can't always have somebody standing there saying, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, or whatever else. That's why friendship with Christ, fellowship with Christ is really what it's all about. And I like to picture myself kind of like a piece of metal in between two powerful magnets, you know. God the stronger magnet, but certainly sin is a very strong pull. And if you think about it, the closer you get to a magnet, the stronger the pull gets. And there's a point where it's like, whack, it's going to go up against it. And so I found in my life that if I start fellowshipping with this side, well, I'm going to find it very, very attractive. But if I'll fellowship with God and keep that connection with him, you know what? The pull is nowhere near as strong on those things because God's pull is so much stronger in my life. And so fellowship's a big one. But this is the one that maybe we should think the most about in the context of tonight, which is foresight, foresight. It's really important to ask yourself, where has this road taken me the last time? The last time I took it, where did it go? Did it go somewhere I want to go? Did it bring me closer to the Lord? Did it really take me to that promised life or did it do something else? Did it kind of take me back to Egypt? What are the consequences long-term of these choices I'm making? And this is what's so great. We can also look at the lives of others and say, where did the choices they make? Where did they go, those who went down this road before me? 10, 20, 30 years down the line, not just tomorrow, but long term and even into eternity. That's what God's word does so wonderfully for us is it holds out all these examples, good and bad, and says, you know what? This is the long-term outcome of each of those choices. And so if there's one great thing about living in the incredibly sick, sin world that we live in, it's this, there are lots of good bad examples. I mean, you can find them without even looking. No shortages of mistakes that you can look at and say, well, I don't want to make that one. And again, I don't want to just heap sorrow upon sorrow or mention other people, but you know, Britney Spears, I, just thinking about her, you know, I feel sorry for her. And, and I hope every time you see some other dumb thing that has gone on with her life, Please just pray for that lady because, you know, one of the many lessons from her life, the sad thing is many people will laugh at her bad example, but they will fall right into the same trap in their own way because you know what? So many young ladies, they just want to focus on the physical and get that attention from it and all that kind of thing. And you know what? The very same people who were so enamored of her when she was perfect, she puts on a few pounds and they ridicule her and they make fun of her and they blog about her and everything else. And you go, wow, that's the kind of friends you want to have? That's the one of life you want to pursue? No way. And so you see all around us, you know, the American idols just falling one after another, wandering in the wilderness, dying in the desert, and yet so many people want to be just like them. And you say, well, how could this be? You know, divorce, drugs, suicide attempts, nude pictures being posted all over the place. And you say, man, oh, if I could grow up to be rich and famous. You go, man. No, thank you. And so you see verse 14. Therefore, my, my beloved, flee from idolatry. That's where he leaves it. And I love it because it's such a simple summary. After all that he said about these things, if you really want to know what it is to avoid these potholes that these people fall into, it's flee from idolatry. Why is that? Because 
Your idol is the thing that you worship. That's the primary passion of your life. And so he says, therefore, in conclusion, get away from false gods in your life, whatever they might be, whatever manifestation they might have. I'm not even talking just about little plastic statues. That's not the point. But what he's saying is only the true and living God and a real relationship with him can give us the personal power to overcome the sin that would seek to destroy our lives and the people that we love the most. Because that's what sin does. It's like a bomb. The closer you are to it, the more you get hurt. And it just explodes the people we care about the most. And so, as you think about this, there will always be good and bad examples in life. There will always be that. And by God's grace, the whole wonderful thing is that we can actually make a choice which one we want to be from this day forward. Now, can't really do much about your past. You might be able to say, man, I've been a, a really bad example. If there's one thing I'm good at in life, it's being a bad example. Well, you know what? You can decide to go a different way. A good example. A good example. And maybe as you're here tonight, you realize, hey, I have been a very bad example. Or maybe tonight you realize, I've tried to be a good example, but I'm coming to realize that good is not good enough. See, the reality is, this is where it comes back to, and this is the opportunity I want to give and, and talk about just here at the close, is that it's a real relationship with God that's going to make the difference. That's why he says flee idolatry. Flee the false gods in life and go after the one true God. See, it's not having your good outweigh your bad. Many people think that. Oh, as long as my good outweighs my bad, God will let me into heaven. No, it's not having your good outweigh your bad. It's having your God outweigh your bad and that's exactly what jesus did on the cross he as the passover lamb laid down his life being not just a good example but the only perfect example that ever lived that those who believe in him would not perish would not be condemned for their sin because we all fall short of the glory of god no matter how good we've been we haven't been good enough no matter how bad we've been we haven't been so bad that god wouldn't want to forgive us and to free us, and to give us new life. So let's close with a prayer. And what I'm going to do is give an opportunity at the end of that prayer. If you know you need to make that decision here tonight, to put your faith in Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that at the end. Father, we thank you so much for these good, bad examples. And Lord, we thank you that we can learn the lessons of their lives the easy way, Lord. Why would we ever want to do things the hard way and to make the mistakes ourselves and say, well, I think I'll have a different outcome from the same action. Lord, that doesn't make any sense at all. We've seen patterns that have repeated throughout human history that those who have gone the ways that we've talked about here tonight, well, it never ended up good for them or for those around them. And so, Lord, we, we want to be smart enough by your Holy Spirit, to look on and say, you know what, I don't want to live my life this way anymore. I want to, by the power of your Spirit and by the truth of your Word, be able to live a life that is pleasing to you, that not only just gets out of the slavery of sin, but goes on to everything that you would have for me, Lord. And even as there are setbacks and mistakes along the way, Lord, thank you for your forgiveness and your mercy. And so with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if there's anyone here tonight who does not know for certain that they have a relationship with Christ, again, not just trusting in your goodness, but trusting in his perfection. That's what it's all about. All you need to do, acknowledge your need here tonight by raising your hand, and I'll pray a prayer with you that can change your life from this moment on. Anybody here tonight who wants to make that decision, all you need to do is slip up your hand at this moment so I can see it. I see you here. God bless you. Anybody else here tonight? I see you over here. God bless you. Anyone else? Even if I'm not seeing you, God is seeing you. Anybody else here tonight want to do that? For those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's a prayer of commitment to Christ and realizing again that God's accepting you because of him not because you've been such a good example. Pray these words with me. God, I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf, for my sin. I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my friend, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins and wash me clean. I want to follow you this day and forever. 
And thank you for the eternal life and the abundant life that you promise. Help me to, by your spirit, understand your word and grow in you. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.